The uh, electronic flash equipment always consists of three parts, an energy source uh, and, a, and a device for storing the energy and discharging suddenly into a, a converter, which we call a flash lamp. The object of this uh, talk this morning is to discuss flash lamps to uh, help prepare you for the experiment that you're going to do on, on flash lamps. Electrically, a flash lamp is an extremely interesting thing because it's completely nonlinear in every possible way, shape, and form, and every lamp is individual. It's different than other lamps. So uh, when you get through experimenting, I hope that you will be convinced that this type of device does have these variations. Here's a typical electronic flash lamp. This is one of the large, real powerful ones that's used for stimulating uh, lasers. It just j discharges a capacitor, a very large capacitor with an inductor in series. And the, one of the biggest uses of flash tubes is for making a, a laser light. Uh, if I put a high voltage on this, I can break it down. And you can see the discharge in the, in the device. There's about 40,000 volts coming out of this. But this is the kind of electricity that doesn't uh, hurt you. You don't want to treat other kinds of like elect ouch electricity the same way. I did that for effect. Uh, you can try this yourself. Uh, <laughs> don't jump too high when you try it the first time. Now I have a, a small flash tube on this display equipment. This is one of them that you'll be using. There are four equipments like this in the laboratory, so no one can. Uh, there are three of you can work simultaneously. And I have a flash tube on here, and I'm. You'll notice there's a sound associated with this. When the sound is on, the juice is going in, and there's a very act, and I'm watching the voltage, 2,000 volts, 2,500 volts, as high as I can go on this particular unit. And of course, nothing happens because I am below the self-starting voltage. Every flash lamp has a self-starting voltage. And usually, we cannot reach this in the laboratory without going to a lot of trouble. The self-starting voltage on that little lamp is probably over 4,000 volts, so it'll be off of this scale. But I can make the lamp go at my command by putting on a stimulator. If I hit the, an external electrode, it breaks down. And if you look closely, you can see a discharge that follows the same path as the spark wire. This is a very important uh, aspect of this whole concept, is be able to control the flash to, to occur at the time that you wish it to occur. Now I'll put on my little spark coil, and I will turn on the high voltage and bring it up to 2,500 volts, and I'll turn on the spark and of course, nothing happens because I'm down here at too low a voltage. So I'll run the voltage up with this attenuator. This controls the frequency at which it flashes. So that's 10. That's about 2 kV. That starts very good. 2 kV down here at about 3,500 volts. So I get a point right there. Now I want to go down to about 2,000 volts where this tube is normally supposed to be used. 2,000 volts, maybe a little bit less. Now I have to put more voltage on to make it go. Going up, going up. Thanks. Ouch, it's still on. There we go. I've got about 2,000 volts on there now. And the spark voltage is still fairly reliable. Now this is the point uh, about this, I want you to understand is that uh, reliability is uh, is bad. So uh, sometimes it goes, sometimes it doesn't go. So I'm up around 2,000 volts, and I'm putting on, uh, according to this curve, uh, about 3,000 volts, somewhere in here. And I get some uncertainties. Let's make, uh, 
if, if down here we get zeros, up here we get x's. But we get some zeros in between. If I go to 1 kV, let's see what happens then. You're going to have a lot of fun turning these knobs, trying to figure out what's going on. There we are. That's the uncertainty point is around 30 on here, which is about 6,000 volts. So up in here somewhere, the uncertainty value for 1 kV. There is a curve, uh, a bottom curve, which de delineates the no-go area. No go. This is a place to stay away from. There's another area which is maybe. And up here's yes. Go. OK. But if you ever design a flash equipment, you want it to be in this area and be up here in good and strong. So it never gets down into this point. There's nothing more discouraging than to work marginally with a flash unit where you haven't got enough spark. So the, the, the rule here is put plenty, plenty of zip into this thing so, that, so that, it, that it will go. Now the object of this first experiment, I haven't read the sheet, but is to determine that curve for one of these tubes. And most of these tubes, I think we've got enough for everybody. You'll be able to select out of this pile one of these tubes. And uh, there are many different shapes and sizes and dimensions. And you can have the tube uh, that you test if you want it. You, you have your opportunity of testing as many of these tubes as you want. If there's a dud, leave it in the box. Don't take it, but only take a good one. How do you tell a good tube? First of all, it should be able to start at, have a minimum starting voltage somewhere down in here uh, around 400 volts. If it, it will not start at 400 volts, uh, throw it out. In other words, and also if you have one that starts with a three or four thousand volts on it, throw it out. What you want is to get a tube that'll be in the range of which you want to use that particular tube. Uh, the uh, electrical characteristics of these tubes are, are fascinating to me. Of course, the light output is the most important thing, but as electrical people, we must learn something about uh, how they operate electrically. You'll notice in this display that there's a very nice little filament of electricity that tends to follow the starting wire. If I put more energy in, this filament gets bigger. And it also gives uh, quite a bit, it gives quite a bit more light and it fills the tube. And that, of course, is what we want when we use a lamp, we want it to be efficient, and we want to get uh, lots and lots of light out of it. Now, the um, electrical characteristics of these tubes are shown in a slide that will come on the screen. Uh, this is a slide of time versus the voltage across the tube, the upper curve. You notice it's marked wrong. The uh, current rises to a peak and then decays to zero. Usually the voltage comes down and leaves a residual voltage on the, uh, on the capacitor. Now every tube, every flash tube that you take will have a different characteristic of this type. Some of these have these little ripples in them and, and they're always different. And this is one thing that makes this type of experimenting interesting is because you never uh, know for sure what is going to come out. As electrical engineers, we're in such a habit of depending on Ohm's law and uh, the other electrical uh, ways in which to calculate circuits that we try to do everything we can by calculation. But when you work with flash lamps, you have to back off every once in a while and go to an analog solution of the, of the equations. It's determined by what the tube itself does. The laws of the tube uh, have not been completely steadied yet. So we have to uh, do as best we can by calculating from examples and then rush into the laboratory and in a few microseconds out comes the answer and it's usually different than what you had. But that is the real answer 
for that particular tube. So this is why people that work with electronic flash do lots and lots of experimenting, because you have to go into the laboratory and you have to do a lot of these things on these nonlinear devices by using the thing itself in order to find out what is, is going on. The second slide shows uh, the same data plotted on a volt ampere curve. On the bottom is current, on the top is volts. At the uh, upper left-hand corner, it starts with the maximum voltage you have across the tube, such as 2,000 volts. Then when the current starts, this current rises very rapidly to thousands of amperes, and then it decays slowly as the capacitor discharges, and it comes down to a residual voltage, a small voltage that's left on the capacitor. Now, if the tube did follow Ohm's law, then you could draw a resistance line. Let's go back to that slide once more. There is a straight line in that. Can you back up to that resistance? Uh, back up to that other slide. There is a resistance there. You'll notice that the, um, that straight line uh, is a resistance line, and everybody that works with flash units gets into a habit very quickly of calculating an approximate resistance. You know that the answers that you're going to get with the resistance are going to be wrong, but they're better than nothing, and so you use them. And one way in which to calculate this resistance is to use the maximum voltage you have on the capacitor divided by the maximum current that you get during a discharge. And you'll notice that that curve, that straight line, intersects the, the real volt ampere curve in several places, and it gives you a sort of an average. And this is a useful concept. Because if you do know the voltage, you do know the resistance of the tube is defined that way, you can immediately calculate the maximum current. As long as uh, the current is limited entirely by the tube. Now, the people that uh, stimulate lasers also put an inductor in there, so this whole thing collapses. Because the inductor is what determines the maximum peak current that flows. But the resistance concept is still uh, useful because it enables you to estimate uh, for a capacitor discharge, the time in which uh, the thing, uh, thing collapses. Now, the next characteristic I want to show you is the one that you've already experimented with in the laboratory, and you know this from uh, old times, is the voltage from a photo cell that tells you the number of candle power, usually up in the millions of candle power, as a function of time. These curves have several bumps and ripples on them. They rise to a peak value in a certain time that it takes to discharge to rise, and then it decays in an exponential form to zero. Now, those of us that work in this field define uh, flash duration as the time between third peak, which is shown very clearly in this slide. It shows the time duration of a flash. Now, how can all this information be presented into a, into a form where you can use it for designing other tubes or for understanding some kind of a tube. This has all been, uh, all the information on a standard tube has been, has been assembled on this sheet that I'll hand you out at the end of the class. It shows the dimensions of the flash tube, and we're going to look at these curves on the view graph uh, in a minute and try to explain to you what they mean so that you will uh, be able to use this uh, information. The lamp in which uh, this experimental work was done was a six inch length lamp, about that long, of this four millimeter uh, inside diameter filled with xenon gas at about 20 centimeters. That's about a, a fifth of an atmosphere. It's excited externally, and the, the variables that you have are the voltage across the tube, the capacitance you have connected across the tube, and you want to know a lot of things about this when you want to apply it to some particular problem. So I'll go over to the view graph and show you these curves. Well, these are the things that we've picked out. Maybe they're the right things, maybe they're not. But the first one that we're interested in is how much peak current do you get if you're designing a circuit? How many thousands of amperes do you get? Well, here's a curve of the peak, uh, peak current. This goes up to uh, about 3,000 amperes, and it's done for capacities that go from 1 microfarad to 200 microfarads, and voltages that go from, from 500 volts to 
3,500 volts. So there's a tremendous range of things that are covered in this experiment. And I think you realize that uh, the data for this was obtained by going into the laboratory and measuring the peak light as a function of these things and mounting them on this log plot so that you could get the whole data on that particular chart. Now, the full rated value of that particular tube is 100 microfarads at 2,000 volts. And so here, 2,000 volts, you read 1,200 amperes. And if you want to know the lamp resistance, you divide 2,000 by 1,200, and it's equal to approximately 2 ohms. 2 ohms, close enough. So you uh, say that is a 2 ohm lamp. And uh, from then on, you can deal with it as a, as a, as a 2 ohm lamp. Now, other things that are of interest is the peak light. If you're doing experimental la uh, in the laboratory and you want to know how many millions of cattle power are coming out, you can measure it, and you go from... Uh, that's 1 million, 10 million, 100 million. Doesn't go up that high. With the same way, capacitors go from 1 microfarad to 200 microfarads, and the voltage covers the same range. And this, again, covers a tremendous range of light uh, over, the, over this range. Now, this standard tube at full load rating, again, reads 8 million 8.5 times 10 to the 6 candle power light. Quite often when we wish to test a photoelectric cell or in the laboratory or some device, we drag out this six inch tube, we put a capacitor of 100 microfarads across it of 2,000 volts, we flash it, and out will come eight and a half uh, million uh, candle power, which makes it easy for us to do, uh, to do our experiments. This curve is a very important one, flash duration, because the first thing that you wish to know when you uh, doing experiments on a subject to stop its motion, you need to know what the flash duration is. If the flash duration is too long, you'll get a blur. So here's flash duration running from 10 microseconds up to 500 microseconds for capacities going from 1 to 100. For the different voltages, you'll notice that there's a tendency for it to be flat. It would be flat if this resistance were constant. But it's not constant. The resistance goes up as you go to lower voltages, and that means these curves go up and the discharge lasts longer. In other words, if you have a small capacitor on a flash lamp like I showed you, you will have a nice little skinny dim filament, which doesn't go anywhere near as high in the light level, and it lasts, uh, lasts a much longer time. So this curve is, is a very useful one. Now, the final curve, and I think one of the most useful ones, is the one of efficiency. Efficiency is uh, given on the, the axis in candle power per watt. If you could double the efficiency of a flash tube, it would be a great thing. So how do you get the efficiency higher than five? I just don't know. But anyway, these are the highs as far as we've been able to get it. But you'll notice that they come up. And again, these are a function of capacity and voltage. And you would think that you would be able to design all the flash units to be efficiency of five. Well, that's a good idea. We should keep working on that and try to get those up. So I think these uh, four curves, you'll have copies of these to take home with you. And you can check these in the, in the lab or as you wish. And uh, you can help to use these for designing other flash tubes. Now, all the information on designing other flash tubes is given in uh, this book, Flash, that you've probably heard about. And uh, the rules uh, are quite simple on how to do this. Suppose you want to make your a tube twice as long. The physics of the tube require that you have exactly the same voltage per unit length. So if you have a 6-inch tube with 2,000 volts on it, and you make a 12-inch tube, how many volts you need on it? 4,000. Hooray, 4,000. If you put 100 watt-seconds into a 6-inch tube, how many watt-seconds do you have to put into the other is the other requirement. You have to put the same number of watt-seconds per cubic centimeter in these two tubes. So you'd have to put 200 in the second tube. And uh, the reasons for this are that the molecules of xenon that are in here swimming around all they know is that they have so many 
joules or watt seconds per molecule, and that the the electrical gradient in here, which is causing them to ionize, is exactly the same. And if you look, if you could get out one xenon molecule from this thing and look at it with an eyeglass, it would react exactly the same in these two tubes, and it would not know whether it was in a six-inch tube or a twelve-inch tube or a thousand-inch tube. So those rules are simple and straightforward, and it's all documented in the, in the technique. And all I can guarantee to you when you use this theory is that you'll get the wrong answer. Because this theory does not include the electrode effects and the wall effects. So what you do is use the theory. You can do it quick, and you can grind out a, what the new tube will probably do. And do I need to tell you? You rush into the laboratory and clip it onto one of these various machines we have there, put the telescope up, and bang, out comes a number, which will tell you exactly how far off your theory is. We have used this uh, technique uh, a great deal in our various uh, development of very large strobe equipment. And it's very useful there, like the one up on top of the Prudential building is a tube that's about that long, and it's a tube about that big, and there's about 5,000 watt seconds into it. And just by taking these dimensional effects, uh, we can hook it up, we can find out what, it'll, what it will do as an optical device. We can get the flash duration, we can get the efficiency, and uh, all these other factors that we need to know can com immediately come out by a, a preliminary, a preliminary uh, try at it. Now the uh, next thing I have to uh, show you is, uh, is discussed as a problem that I do not know the answer to very well. And it's still it's one of the most important things in all flash equipment, and that is the life of the tube. When most people ask me, what is the life of the flash lamp? I say, well, it's usually too long. Of course, that's the view of the man in the factory that's making them. He wants to grind out a lot of production. But you can make a flash lamp that'll run for years and years and years. In fact, the one on the Museum of Science, I think it's been up there about eight or 10 years. It quit about five years ago, and I rushed over to glory be, the thing is finally broke. But somebody pulled the plug out of the wall. <laughs> and it's still going. And whenever you see the Museum of Science, that little blinker up there, it is, uh, let's see that curve of efficiency. Uh, the curve of efficiency, uh, this is a log plot starting at the bottom with one. You don't have to go below one flash. I hope none of you will have that experience, although it's a lot of fun. Uh, one flash, our lab's full of pieces. Then it goes to 10, 100. Now, most of the tubes, flash tubes are made, uh, have a, a life of 10 flashes. And they're uh, tubes of this type. I think that's a 38. No, that's a different number. That's the tube they're talking about in that curve. It's connected in series with, a, with an inductor. And uh, that curve, let's look at that curve again. We run the curve up uh, as a function of voltage. And you notice it goes to 1,000 volts, and then 2,000 volts, and then at, at 1, there's a kind of a star. That's where we increase the uh, uh, xenon concentration in the strobe alley. That xenon comes out there and uh, gives you an increase of it. Also, two flies around the room, and it's not too uh, uh, healthy a place. If you're going to do this experiment, get something between you and the lamp, because the, the glass doesn't go very fast, but it, it does get in your hair and cause all kinds of trouble. Now, the uh, 10, uh, how do you rate a 10 lamp flash? You don't, you don't blow up after 10 flashes. But what happens is that the electrodes will melt away, the tube will get dark and black, and so its efficiency will reduce. So this type of lamp, which is used for stimulating l these very powerful lasers, they give us a tremendous whack. Its life is only 10 flashes. Then you throw it out and put in four or five new ones. On the other end of the scale, at the top end of that curve, it goes up to 1,000 and 10,000 and 100,000. Most of the electronic flash units that are used in small portable equipments run around Oh, 100,000. They guarantee 10,000, but you have a hard time counting after 10,000. Most of them will run over, over 10,000. But the ones that you want to put in beacons run 
one million and ten million, and I think the one over there on the Museum of Science has run actually about somewhere around a hundred million, and it's still going strong. Of course, this is done by reducing the energy in the in the tube and tending to your business. So this curve is a very interesting one to uh, to follow, and it's going to become uh, more important as time goes on because. One of the advantages of using an electronic flash lamp as a beacon in a lighthouse or something is a flash is a point that it will flash for a long, long time without attention. Now, when I was in high school, uh, I lived in a prairie town out in Nebraska that had a courthouse that went up about a thousand miles. Snow was only 500, 600 feet. But one of my jobs as a high school student was to go up there, open the window, reach out, and unscrew a 200 watt bulb when it burned out. And I can still remember how it looked like it was way up. So now that courthouse has four 10-watt second xenon flash tubes in it, and I service them from Boston about once every six months. They keep right on going. So I'm, I'm still doing the same job I did in 1920 when I was a high school student. I still climb up that darn tower and open the window, but I don't have to reach out so far. And it, if any of you uh, go out through the prairie in Nebraska, there will, there will be one unique courthouse. There's one every 25 miles. And that's in Roar, Nebraska. You'll, that's the only one out there with st four strobes on it. So it's quite distinctive. In fact, people driving along the road come dashing in and say, what are those blinking lights doing on that, <laughs> on that uh, courthouse? And I'm going to be out there next week. Uh, I'm going to take a few spare tubes, and I'll dust them off, clean them off, put them in. But those tubes will last a long, long time. This is very important for lighthouses and for beacons. You don't want to change them often. A tungsten lamp, if it's used efficiently, will never run more than a month. If it's used inefficiently, it'll run longer. Uh, xenon flash tubes, of course, will run. Uh, nobody really had enough patience to find out how long they actually uh, will go. Now, I have just a few slides at the end to kind of wind this up, and I thought I'd show you a few pictures, a few applications. This, this one, the uh, next uh, slide will show uh, I'm very much interested in underwater. Now here the strobe is not used because of its short speed. It's not used because of its, of, of its uh, any purpose, but the ability to get out a small battery uh, enough light to take hundreds and hundreds of pictures. Now it's been my pleasure to work in uh, cameras. We've had them down, oh, we've had them down five miles deep, and uh, every, they're taking pictures of the bottom of the ocean. There's an awful lot of it to be photographed, and we're still working on this angle of it. The next slide shows a. A uh, color picture of a balloon with a bullet going through it, in case any of you haven't done this. When you shoot it through a balloon, there's several uh, possibilities. If the balloon is only partly deflated, then the bullet will go in and out, and it will not uh, tear. The air will just squirt out through this hole. And you'll notice that there's a ring, a wave, where it's coming out from where the bullet went in. The other thing is to blow the balloon up very tight, and when you shoot the bullet through it, it will tear. And if you put the light around back, you'll see a little line going through where this tear occurs. The next slide shows a, a golf, golfer with mullet flash. So you've had a chance to do some of this uh, in the laboratory, and I hope you'll keep this in mind, because this is one of the most interesting types of photography there is, where you put a time sequence of a whole lot of pictures onto a stationary film so that you've got a time record of what goes on. And I don't need to tell you that you have to move your lights around so that you do not light the background, you use a black background, you use a white subject, and a lot of contrast, and so forth and so on. And the last slide, I, uh, there's one more in there. It shows MIT from, uh, with an 80,000 watt second strobe. There's one of these hanging in Strobe Alley. This was made in 1944 with uh, 80,000 watt seconds and two giant tubes in a big airplane flying up in the sky. And someday I hope to build a, rate, a real powerful strobe, not one of these, uh, these types. So this uh, concludes this lecture, and I hope that all of you will have some good experiences in the laboratory.